Brent L. Topp. He is the Dean of Religious Education at Brigham Young University and Professor of Church History and Doctrine. At the time of his appointment as Dean in June 2013, Dr. Topp was serving as the Chair of Department of Church History and Doctrine. Prior to his appointment to the BYU Religion Faculty in 1987, he was an instructor and administrator in seminaries and institutes. Professor Topp is the author of many books and numerous articles. He and his wife Wendy served a mission from 2004 to 2007 when Brother Topp presided over the Illinois Peoria mission. They have four children and 17 grandchildren and live in Pleasant Grove, Utah, where Brother Topp serves as the president of the Pleasant Grove Utah East Stake. And without further ado, Brother Topp. Thank you. It is indeed an honor to be invited to participate in this annual Sidney B. Sperry Symposium on the Scriptures. My life and my teaching have been enriched by the scriptural scholarship of Dr. Sperry. Likewise, I have been blessed so, by so many others who through the years have participated in this symposium which bears Dr. Sperry's name. I am grateful for the profound gospel insights and significant scriptural research regarding the standard works that have come from the Sperry Symposium. Perhaps a disclaimer is in order at this point. I do not profess to be a New Testament scholar. I was not trained in biblical studies or classical Greek. I do not have much background in first century Judaism or what life was like in ancient Roman times. How grateful I am, however, to have learned from women and men, both Latter-day Saints and those not of our faith, who do have those various kinds of expertise. My understanding of and appreciation for the New Testament has been deepened by such scholarship. It is particularly gratifying to me that the focus of this symposium is the life, ministry, and message, and the enduring contributions to our faith of the Apostle Peter. He is one of my heroes, not in some superficial hero worship sort of way, but rather in what I consider to be the truest meaning of the word. A hero is one who in the face of adversity or from a position of weakness displays faith, courage, and sacrifice for others. Unfortunately, in today's celebrity-centric pop culture, few of those who are viewed as heroes to millions exhibit the virtues of faith, courage, or self-sacrifice. They are most often the superstars of sports and movies, rock stars, stars of reality TV, which is an oxymoron in my estimation, and stars who have become stars for really nothing whatsoever. No wonder worship of such heroes is like chasing a mirage. It looks like something, but it really isn't. My heroes are not perfect, Jesus Christ accepted. They have faults and foibles, frailty and fallibility, just like me. That's what endears them to me. They have faith and faithfulness. That inspires me. Their faithfulness with fallibility and devotion despite deficiencies gives me hope. Unfortunately, Latter-day Saints are not immune from unhealthy hero worship. Some expect perfection from their heroes, whether those heroes are prophets, apostles, bishops, or even religion professors. There is a tendency to view past and present church leaders and historical events through the sanitizing lens of a church video, portraying characters that never have a hair out of place, who always say the right thing and speak in soft, hushed tones. But that is not reality and sometimes it does more harm than good. Recognizing and even appreciating the fallibility of church leaders can help us to avoid the unrealistic and unhealthy hero worship which has led some to lose their faith when their hero inevitably shows his or her fallible and fallen nature, despite also demonstrating great faith and devotion. Of this, President Dieter F. Uchtdorf recently reminded us, quote, Some struggle with unanswered questions about things that have been done or said in the past. 
We openly acknowledge that in nearly 200 years of church history, along with an uninterrupted line of inspired, honorable, and divine events, there have been some things said and done that could cause people to question. And to be perfectly frank, there have been times when members or leaders in the church have simply made mistakes. There have been, been things said or done that were not in harmony with our values, principles, or doctrine. President Uchtdorf continues, I suppose the church would be perfect only if it were run by perfect beings. God is perfect and his doctrine is pure, but he works through us, his imperfect children and imperfect people make mistakes. It is unfortunate that some have stumbled because of mistakes made by men. But in spite of this, the eternal truth of the restored gospel found in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is not tarnished, diminished, or destroyed." End of quote. The prophet Joseph Smith often worried about unrealistic hero worship among new converts to the church who upon immigrating to Nauvoo would have their first encounter with a real prophet. William Clayton recorded that on the 29th of October, 1842, the prophet, quote, went over to the store where a number of brethren and sisters were assembled who had arrived this morning. He said that he was but a man and they must not expect him to be perfect. If they expected perfection from him, he should expect it from them. But if they would bear with his infirmities and the infirmities of the brethren, he would likewise bear with their infirmities." End of quote. In a sermon preached a little over a month before he was martyred, the prophet Joseph declared, I never told you I was perfect, but there is no error in the revelations which I have taught. My own personal testimony of the prophet Joseph Smith is not weakened in the least by the fact that he was not perfect. That he, like each of us, had infirmities and fallibilities, even made mistakes along the way. In fact, it strengthens my testimony to know that God can do his work and perform mighty miracles through fallible but faithful disciples. President Gordon B. Hinckley taught, a man may have a wart on his cheek and still have a face of beauty and strength. But if the wart is emphasized unduly in relation to his other features, the portrait is lacking in integrity. There was only one perfect man who ever walked the earth. The Lord has used imperfect people in the process of building his perfect society. If some of them occasionally stumbled or if their characters may have been slightly flawed in one way or another, the wonder is, is the greater that they accomplished so much." End of quote. So it is with Peter. He was not perfect. As a mortal, he had his full, of, full share of weaknesses. Yet there is no record of his directly admitting, like Joseph Smith said, I never told you that I was perfect. But the New Testament record is an indirect admission of just that. In the Gospels, his shortcomings seem to be deliberately on display. The Gospel of Mark, a book that many scholars characterize as the memoirs of, Peter's, of Peter, clearly his fingerprints are throughout it and it may very well be the primary source material for the Gospels of Luke and Matthew that were later written. Richard Bauckham, a Bible scholar not of the LDVS faith, said, it has long been debated whether Mark's predominantly negative portrayal of Peter as the foolishly self-confident disciple who misunderstands Jesus and fails him could plausibly de be derived from Peter's own self-depiction. A remarkable feature of this characterization of Peter is that it remains constant through all four canonical Gospels. Petrine materials in the other Gospels that is not parallel to Marx displays the same character traits in Peter. Impetuosity, self-confidence, outspokenness, and extravagant devotion to Jesus." End of quote. 
As a primary source for the Gospels, Peter may be consciously highlighting, perhaps even overstating his weaknesses and failures while downplaying his accomplishments and understating his incredible faith in and devotion to the Master. We see his fallibility and imperfections up close and personal, but we also witness the remarkable transformation from Simon the fisherman to Peter the Rock, the chief apostle. As Bauckham concludes, quote, thus the full and nuanced characterization of Peter has the effect of encouraging readers or hearers to sympathize and ad- identify with him, end of quote. It is this notion upon which I wish to focus tonight. This paper or presentation is not intended to be a scholarly, in-depth, cultural, or linguistic examination of the texts associated with Peter's life and ministry. It is neither an examination of the chief apostle's achievements nor a discussion of the doctrinal contributions of his teachings. Others far more qualified than I will, uh, than I will address those topics in the presentations that follow. This presentation, however, is my own personal observation and testimony of Peter's faithfulness despite his fallibility and the transforming power of the grace of Christ. I don't just sympathize with Peter. I empathize with him because I see myself in him in many ways. I can relate to him. Like Peter, I have been known to impetuously do or say something that within minutes I regret. Like Peter, I say things that I think are profound or clever only to realize that they fall flat, are inappropriate, or diminish the significance of the moment at hand. A couple of examples from the life of Peter illustrate this dimension of human nature, or at least my human nature. After the transcendent events that occurred on the Mount of Transfiguration, think of it, being ministered to and instructed by heavenly beings, beholding unspeakable visions of glory, and witnessing the remarkable uh, transfiguration of the Lord himself, Peter, in his enthusiasm, blurted out, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias, end of quote. Now, much could be written on what, perhaps, what Peter perhaps meant, but suffice it to say, as Luke editorialized, quote, not knowing what he said. Luke was, in essence, telling us that what Simon had stated, though well-intended, was a feeble attempt at best to capture the significance of the moment. It would be like Joseph Smith saying as the first vision concludes, wow, that was awesome. (laughs) I can imagine that as soon as the words escaped his mouth, Peter was hoping to reel them back in. Yet despite this, he received under the hands of angelic ministrants the keys of the kingdom and the divine charge to lead the Savior's church after his resurrection. The master heard Peter's feeble, fallible, perhaps even foolish words, yet looked into his heart and saw faithfulness and a future. On another occasion, Jesus taught the apostles, as Mark records, quote, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Mark tells us that the Savior spoke openly and often of his impending death, but Peter, quote, took him and began to rebuke him. Clearly, he didn't understand all the implications of what the Master was teaching. Not wanting to hear that Jesus would soon die, Peter Peter declared, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be. Though speaking from his heart, Peter's rebuking words to the Son of God were ignorant and inappropriate. Who did he think he was to correct or rebuke the Lord? Peter's words resulted in an unusually sharp rebuke from Jesus. 
Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things of God that be of God, but those that be of man, end of quote. What a harsh rebuke. What had Peter said or done that warranted such a strong reaction? Was there some sort of pride in his heart that needed to be subdued and replaced with humility and submission? Was he proud of his devotion to and protection of the master? Was it that he valued Jesus' life more than he at that moment valued what Christ's death would mean? It may be that in his rebuke, Jesus is reminding Peter that there are some things worth dying for. Did Peter's words demonstrate that he had zeal without knowledge, courage without comprehension? Whatever the case, Simon's words were not what he wished they would have been. No doubt he felt badly for his foolishness. Yet the Savior loved him and saw in him more future strength than present weakness. Peter's words at that time showed his mortal fallibility in all its glory, insensitivity, impetuousness, and even ignorance. Yet those words, even when they didn't come out right, also showed incredible faithfulness. Peter's love for and devotion to the Savior, albeit without full comprehension of what that love and devotion would ultimately require. Two such examples are seen in John's account of the Last Supper. Quote, Jesus, Jesus riseth from supper and laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself. And after he poureth water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wiped them with the towel wherewith he was girded, then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou, uh, what I do thou knowest not now but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. To Peter, having the Savior gird in a towel, that was a symbol of a household servant or a common slave doing a most menial and unpleasant task. To Peter, it seemed as the utmost humiliation. He would have no part of it. He saw the towel, the basin of water, and the master on his hands and knees, but he did not see the symbolism. Thou shalt never wash my feet. Peter's words were aimed to protect the Savior from humiliation. Or could it have been a glimpse of Peter's own prejudice, a feeling that one in a position of importance need not and should not lower themselves to such servitude? In the next moments, however, he would once again wish he hadn't been so quick to speak. His words, though uttered with noble intent, would once again miss the mark as he began to realize that the master spoke not of physical cleansing, but of becoming clean from his own sins through, his, through Christ's atonement. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Beginning to understand the deeper meaning, Simon Peter then blurted out with typical passion and overstatement, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. <laughs> Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. The Savior's words served to tamp down Peter's overzealousness. Zeal can be a virtue, but only to a point. Thereafter, it can be a vice. This was a challenge that at times plagued Peter. Another example illustrates this. During the Last Supper, Jesus once again plainly taught the apostles of his imminent death. Quote, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Whither I go, ye cannot come. End of quote. 
Like at the Mount of Transfiguration, the real meaning of Savior's words went right past Peter, neither sticking in his head or in his heart. Simon Peter said unto him, Whither thou goest, or whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. From the lips of Simon came another bold declaration of dying devotion to, and steadfast faith. At least for the moment, mortal fallibilities and fatigue and fear will dramatically manifest themselves before the sun rises and the cock crows. His zeal and courage would surely be tested. As much as I hate to admit it, I see myself much like Simon Peter at that moment. There have been times when my actions haven't exactly squared with my words, when my behavior hasn't matched my beliefs. Like Peter, I have at times literally declared, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I have covenanted to take his name upon me and keep his commandments, and yet spiritually speaking, I fall asleep when he needs me most. Could ye not watch with me one hour? Jesus asks me and you today, as he did that night to Peter and the disciples in Gethsemane. Like Simon, there have been times when in my own unique way, I have said, I go a fishing. When the Savior instead has invited me to feed his lambs, feed his sheep, feed his sheep. And I am not alone. President Gordon B. Hinckley said, so many of us are so much like Peter. We pledge our loyalty. We affirm our determination to be of good courage. We declare sometimes, even publicly, that come what may, we will do the right thing, that we will stand for the right cause, that we will be true to ourselves and to others. Then the pressures begin to build. Sometimes there are social pressures. Sometimes there are personal appetites. Sometimes there are false ambitions. There is a weakening of the will. There is a softening of discipline. There is capitulation. And then there is remorse, self-accusation, and bitter tears of regret. In the end, however, Simon's faithfulness overcomes his fallen, foolish, impetuous, speaking without thinking nature. He did what he said he would. He did lay down his life for the Savior's cause. Will my faith be greater than my foibles? Will I allow my mortal selfishness to be consumed by charity, service, and sacrifice as it was for Peter? In a way, Simon Peter, like Adam, is a type not only for prophets, but for all of us. We see both the effects of the fall and the atonement in him in his fallibility and his faithfulness. We see in him the natural man and the saint. There is one scriptural account where this is most evident. It is the account of Peter's walking on water and the offense, events associated with that miracle. Quote, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. It is in the next few verses where we see so clearly in Peter both faith and fallibility. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Now, I've thought a lot about this one verse and have wondered what Peter's words really mean. At first glance, it appears that fearful Simon, the simple Galilean fisherman who had fished those very waters and had experienced many, many storms on that lake, 
was calling out to the ghostly figure approaching them. Who goes there? I can almost hear him yelling. Upon hearing those words, the master responds, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. Undoubtedly, Peter felt a sense of relief. At that point, both, him, both his and the other disciples' hearts were lifted with hope for rescue. But could there have been some doubt in their minds? They had never seen another man walking effortlessly on the top of crashing waves. Could their minds be playing tricks on them? Was it a ghost? Was it really the master? If so, how could that be? How could any mortal man comprehend that miracle at that moment under those frightening circumstances? Could it really be? None of us can know what was going on in Simon's head. We can only speculate why he said what he did. Was it just typical Peter impetuousness, speaking without thinking through what his words could mean? Was it just another example of Peter's zeal or bravado? Or could it be something more? I do not know the answer, but there is a possibility that at least to me gives special meaning to the events that follow. Could it have been that when Peter declared, if it be thou, he was throwing down the gauntlet, as it were, challenging or testing the person walking on the water claiming to be Jesus, the Son of God, to prove his identity. He was not sure at the moment. If it was a ghost, there is fear. If it is merely a figment of Peter's own imagination, then there is false hope, no promise of rescue. However, if it is truly the Christ, then there is hope then Peter can have faith and confidence. But what if it isn't him? If thou be the Son of God, if. Peter's challenge at that moment, whatever his intentions, is reminiscence of another such challenge, clearly not aught uttered in faith or devotion. If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from the pinnacle of the temple and give the angels charge that in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. If thou be the Son of God, fall down and worship me. Now please do not misunderstand. I am not equating what Lucifer says in those temptations to what Peter says at that moment. Satan was taunting, tempting, and desirous to destroy. Peter, in that moment, in that desperation, in the desperation of, of the moment, in the desperation of the moment, Peter uh, is wondering aloud, faith wavering, perhaps with nagging doubts, with nagging doubts. The teleprompter's gone out, and I've just got to find myself. Please excuse me. Okay. Uh, and so the, ter uh, the doubt adding to the terror of that night. Uh, faith and uh, <clears throat> Lucifer was rebuked and summarily dismissed by Jesus. Simon Peter, however, received an invitation from the master, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the sheep, ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. Faith and fallibility are on full display in this scriptural account. Much has been said and written about the account through the years. 
Most often, the focus has been on either Peter's faltering little faith that caused him to sink when the waves crashed against him, or his supernatural ability to actually walk on water. Both perspectives accurately reflect the scriptural account. But to me, there is another message, symbolism, types, and shadows, if you will, that testifies of Christ's saving and enabling power, divine grace that snatches fallen man from the depths of despair and certain death. Whether Peter momentarily doubted Jesus' divinity or couldn't comprehend what he was seeing and experiencing, whether he feared for his life, temporarily lost his focus, or any combination of these factors become irrelevant when he steps out of the boat. Simon could easily have cowered in the back of the boat with the others. He could have ignored the Savior's invitation to walk to him. Yet despite some understandable doubt and fear, he had sufficient faith to step out of the boat and take some steps toward the Savior. As remarkable as it was that he walked on water a step or two or more, which was dramatically more than had ever been done or would ever be done by any other mortal, what he and the other disciples experienced after he sunk deep into the sea was infinitely more remarkable and life-changing. To me, this is a scriptural story of triumph and transformation more than failure or lack of faith. The focus should not be on Simon's sinking, but on Jesus's lifting. Not on Peter's human fallibility, but Christ's divine ability. I am convinced that Peter's faith became stronger and his leadership more tempered from sinking than from walking on the water. Uh, I am convinced that what he and the other disciples needed was, uh, was not just walking on the water and the awe of that miracle and perhaps awe of Peter. That is not what they needed. The chief apostle's triumph came later in a different way, in what he learned from the master and what he became because of this experience a transformation that resulted from sinking and then being rescued by the Lord. The scriptures continue. And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. That is a short and simple verse, but it raises many questions. How far were Jesus and Peter away from the boat? How did Jesus lift Peter out of the water? How did they get back into the boat? The scriptural record is silent with regard to those things, but, but perhaps in that silence we can see the message of the miracle. I believe that Simon the fisherman, despite his experience and skill as a fisherman on that very lake, thought at that moment he was going to drown. In absolute terror he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Have you ever felt you were sinking, drowning as it were, and called out for the Savior for rescue and relief? Peter's anguished cry for physical rescue mirrors those of, Book of, Mormon, of the Book of Mormon prophet who cried out to the Lord for spiritual rescue. O oh, Jesus, thou Son of God, have mercy on me, who am in the gall of bitterness, and am encircled about by the everlasting chains of death. Jesus, as the scripture states in the New Testament, immediately stretched forth his hand and caught him, and by the hand lifted him back to the surface, like a father would lift a fallen child back to his feet. To me, the miracle is not so much that Peter may have taken a step or two on the surface of the water at first, <clears throat> at, the, at first, but rather that he was, uh, if I can get there, but he cried out, the Lord saved me and caught hold of the Savior's outstretched hand. 
As a young missionary in Denmark, I gained a greater appreciation for this miracle as I read the Bible in the Danish language. The word that is translated as come in English is come, K-O-M, in Danish. It sounds the same and means the same mostly. But there is an additional meaning in Danish that isn't necessarily found in English. The Savior's invitation to come unto me, or in Danish, come till my, can be translated walk to me or walk with me. Jesus beckoned Peter to come, not just to walk to him, but walk with him. That is the great miracle. Of a truth thou art the Son of God, the disciples cried out in amazement. What manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? What manner of man indeed? No wonder Peter and the other apostles glorified God. Not only did Jesus walk on water and silence the storms by his very word, but he enabled Peter to do the same. What a learning experience for Peter who would be expected to lead the kingdom at the Savior's death. And for each of us, whatever our own role and responsibilities, when walking on water by yourself, you will always sink. That is a fact of life for all fallen, fallible men. But when you take hold of the Savior's outstretched hand of grace and walk to him and with him, you cannot fail. And if men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. I give unto men weakness that they may be humble, and grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things strong, uh, weak things become strong unto them. Simon the fisherman, with all his faults and failings and fallibility that come with mortality, became Peter the rock only through the grace of Christ. It is his grace that enables and transforms. Elder David A. Bednar taught, the enabling power of the atonement of Christ strengthens us to do things we could never do on our own. This enabling and strengthening aspect of the atonement helps us to see and to do and to become good in ways that we could never recognize or accomplish with our limited mortal capacity. I testify and witness that the enabling power of Jesus' atonement is real. Peter is my hero because like me, he had his share of weaknesses. And he, like me, sometimes says dumb, said dumb things, acted impetuously, faltered, failed, doubted, denied, and even stepped on some toes and cut off an ear along the way. I can relate to all that except perhaps the cutting off an ear part. He is my hero, not because of those fallibilities, but in spite of them. He is my hero because of what he became, not what he made of himself, but what Christ made of him. He was a simple Galilean fisherman who tried to do good, but didn't always. He was well-intentioned, but like Joseph Smith, was a rough stone that needed some refining to become a smooth and polished shaft in the quiver of the Almighty. He was a natural man who, through the master's touch, was transformed into a mighty man of God, in whose very shadow the sick and the afflicted and the fallible and the fallen were healed by the grace of Christ. President Thomas S. Monson said, when the master sought a man of faith, he did not select him from the throng of the self-righteous who were found regularly in the synagogue. 
Rather, he called him from among the fishermen of Capernaum. Peter heard the call, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Peter followed. Simon, man of doubt, became Peter, apostle of faith, end of quote. Peter is my hero in the truest sense of the word. I don't worship him, but I am inspired by him. Although I can empathize, I don't need to emulate his foibles and fallibilities. I have plenty of my own, but I am inspired by what he became through the transforming power and grace of Christ. I can only hope that just as Jesus could make something of Simon the simple fisherman, he will do the same for me. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.